muy clara que algo empezaba a germinar en el ánimo de una sociedad. To germinate in the mood of a society that was still far from taking a definitive turn. Thus, in the revolutionary environment which was spreading, the general enthusiasm arised, aroused the hopes of some women who, animated by the political discourse of the revolution, thought they could achieve that equality of rights, both natural and political. Very soon, they were overwhelmed by disappointment because during the debates of the newly established General Assembly, they were denied access not only to political sovereignty, but they were excluded from their supposed universal rights. But despite these obstacles, two women significantly represented the desires that began to float in the environment in those years, the search for a new place in society. The English Mary Wollstonecraft, who already in 1793 claimed the rights of women and denied the deep-rooted idea of the natural inferiority of women in abilities and that differences were rather the result of education and socialization and not biological differences, of course, we had the French Olympe de Gouges, her name was Marie Gouges, who in, in 1791, as she saw women excluded for the universal rights, promoted the declaration of the rights of women and, this, and of the citizen. And she says, the woman is born free and remains equal to men in rights. This brave woman was sentenced to death by guillotine in 1793 as a result of her boldness. However, the changes generated by the French Revolution that would impact not only Europe, but also the Spanish and Portuguese colonies beyond the sea in terms of women, especially during the first half of the century, meant a regression to a greater conservatism in relation to women's rights which had an impact on their position within the social and legal structure. It was insisted with greater emphasis on the natural need for the subordination of women to men and on the difference in spheres of action between them, reinforcing the idea that the domestic sphere and the family were the ideal place for women. Despite what was said before, the female feminine voices were not silent and they gave rise to a struggle, a search that would be strengthened throughout the century not, and that not only would be maintained, but would open spaces to those women who demanded their rights. Obviously, the exclusion could be maintained, but not without the knowledge of the existence of the discordant voices of the first feminism. The other great revolution that we pointed out, which began during the second half of the 18th century and which influenced the transformation of life in the economic, political, social, and cultural environment was the Industrial Revolution with the mechanization of production thanks to the use of new forms of energy and not only the force of man, animal, or wind, such as a steam with the use of coal, there was a brilliant stage of development thanks to inventions that transformed the world economy. This would favor the increase of labor participation for women, which added to traditional jobs uh, such as the home, uh, the children, the husband, the family, and agricultural in many cases, they expanded the female presence in uh, different environments. By the second half of the 19th century, some activities would be significantly occupied uh, by the feminine sex, such as teaching, nursing, typists, when the typewriter appeared, and something very funny with regard to the typewriter is that the machine producer, since the woman was more fit for that, started producing typewriters 
to started to add some decorations that uh, referred to the feminine part. So they would decorate the typewriters with flowers, for instance. Also like workers in the textile industry, um, telephone uh, telephonists uh, when the phone was invented. Since uh, an operator had to speak, we asked for children or adolescents to answer but then we saw in time that women answered in a more um, uh, pleasant manner. So they started to get into that field. Toward the last years of the century, we see them venturing little by little in the field of professions such as medicine, law, literature, journalists, and of course also in medicine, especially in the professionalization of the midwives in obstetrics. These changes, all of this happened within the framework of a time that was uh, filled with political movement that were added to the social aspect. They altered the order and they caused a constant state of instability and confrontation. Those who sought new forms of government of greater representation and ideologies that confronted each other, monarchists, republicans, conservatives, or liberals, and those who at the turn of the century would be joined by socialists, representing a society that was transforming day by day and that opened the door to new political, economic, and social players. All of this was hand in hand with the growth of a thriving bourgeoisie, which consolidated as a class owners of capital and supporters of an economy that did not meet the needs of its counterpart in the social structure, the working class devoid of protection, alien to welfare, a class without rights. And that had begun to show its discontent, for example, in England uh, through the cartism this is a workers um, movement that began in London and it was not only seeking for social improvement as far as salary and other, it demanded a voice in the parliament. They asked for a vote and a space to be represented in parliament. This movement failed, it was repressed, but it set the basis and it was the first mass movement in the working class, yes? This political and social effervescence spread throughout Europe, manifesting itself in revolutionary waves, armed movements that clearly marked the situation at various times. Those are of the 20s, around the 30s, and of course, that of 1848, the latter, with a marked accent, not only political and nationalist, but also socialist, social, sorry. There were many dreams in those who gave character to the century, dreams of emancipation, unity or independence, new political systems. They fought to defend their ideas that placed them in antagonistic positions, but all of them desired to achieve progress in the light of their perception. And in this environment of search, of course, women could not stay uh, out the aspirations of those pioneers who fought for a more just and more equitable world, a different place in society. These are years that we can see as the starting point of the suffragette movement present in all industrial societies, which took on two concrete objectives, the right to vote and education, right to education. The changes that took place were an impact internationally through a new division of labor, since at the same time as all of the above, the traditional powers joined in the last years of the century by three emerging powers, the new consolidated German empire and two extra European powers, United States of America 
and the empire of the rising sun in Japan as they struggled to secure a position among themselves. This rivalry was the result of a new form of appropriation of the peripheral world, an international policy known as the new imperialism, a politics not exempt from competition and source of future conflict that will culminate in the outbreak of the Great War in 1914, inaugurating a new type of confrontation, the total war. That was the century where Antonia lived, was educated, worked, and finally the hard, difficult, but rewarding path in the eyes of a God that was present, even in the midst of human misery. Antonia did not remain oblivious to the events of her time. She did not escape the ups and downs of uncertainty in a world in transformation. Her life was affected by them at different times. And that took her through unforeseen paths that happened during the years of 1854, which caused the hasty departure from Spain toward the French exile of the family of the Queen Mother Christina with them, uh, of herself as governess of the Infantas. The, the anguish suffered years later in Rome before the difficult situation of the Supreme Pontiff Pius IX that deeply affected the Lady of Oviedo and, and of which which is recorded in one of her letters. In those words, she leaves her feelings regarding her condition as a woman in certain circumstances. And I quote her, I would like to be a bishop to protest against, uh, to protest the attack with a pastor or a priest, to read it from the pulpit or an eminent writer, to write articles or a soldier, to give life for the cause of the pontificate but I am but a poor woman who counts for nothing in the world and can only cry and pray. Antonia arrives in Spain. She had received a good education from her early years in Fribourg, Switzerland. Her aptitudes were recognized as well as her willingness to study. And this allowed her to be considered by her teachers as very suitable, so that while still very young, she could work as a governess. She had a deep religiosity, vocation of service, respect for work and discipline, values instilled by her mother, thanks to her example and advice her mother was a figure and fundamental reference throughout her life. Her mother writes to her as she was in school in Fribourg, the need to work is a grace. Without it, we fall into the vice of idleness. Remember that the one who relies on his work is the one who's best sustained. I'm pleased to need to live from my work and I celebrate knowing you so laborious and even the hours of recreation are used to acquire useful knowledge. Antonia was 16 when she was hired to educate the daughter of the Marquise of La Romana, La Romana. Antonia's life took an important turn and began a time where traveling was a daily activity for Antonia. Eager to increase her knowledge, it would be not only profitable but pleasant. Her writings are a valuable legacy as she relates her experiences with the family of the Marquise she moved to Italy where she stayed for two years and she returned to Switzerland with her mother where to support herself and thanks to her training she opened a boarding facility for young people in Fribourg. It was the years before the outbreak of the conflict of the year 48, dark years marked by conflicts hindering the viability of the boarding facility and the impossibility to sustain it. Therefore, she had to take the opportunity to work as a governess again, but now that opportunity was being offered by the Spanish Royal House, 
recommended by the ambassador of Spain in Bern because of her training, character and deep values. The queen regent, Doña Cristina II, wife of Ferdinand VII and mother, mother of the future queen, sorry, married with uh, Agustin Fernandez Duques, she chose Antonia for this position. Antonia was fit for this position and would have under her care the education of the daughters of the marriage, Maria Amparo, Maria de los Milagros, and Maria Cristina. The decision to accept this assignment was not easy. She had to leave her mother again, and she had rejected a marriage proposal that was very advantageous, which perhaps would have solved her, solved her economic situation. This issue of marriage in the 19th century was not something exceptional. It was natural for women from good families to find a good opportunity and a good marriage to secure their existence. But Antonia, as she always did, did not uh, give in before the obstacles and she decided, and I quote her, God only knows how hard, how hard the sacrifice was to accept the odds of fairness, but with anything less painful than the honorific covenant that was being proposed to me. On January 21st, 1848, she left for Spain, the land of her father, but nothing made her foresee that she would face one of the most painful passages of her life since that day, would be the last time she would see her mother alive. Her mother died on February 3rd that same year. From that moment, without imagining it, and despite the years of exile next to the royal family and the trips that would take her out of the peninsula, Antonia's life would be deeply intermingled with the homeland of her father, Antonio Maria de Oviedo, born in Seville, but of Asturian family. The 19th century in Spain, where Antonia was arriving, occurred in the midst of a profound process of transformation and a long crisis. This century marked the decline and loss of the colonial empire and the role of protagonist of the first order among the powers. The once powerful empire languished in the midst of succession disputes, political struggles, internecine wars, economic problems, and uh, backward respect for powers such as Great Britain, France, and Prussia. Spain was stuck between a glorious past and an uncertain future. For the politicians of that period, could not be asked humanly for more than they did to achieve the ruin of their homeland. Harsh words for those who led the country in those years and of which Spain and that Spain survived. As Benito Perez Caldo says, thanks to the vitality of that robust uh, uh, we call Spain. Since the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th, the ideas of illustration and French reproduction had seemed like a seed for the need to seek new heirs of freedom and equality and longed for a change that would allow Spain to move toward modernity, knew that new ideas would be advocated. The end of the old regime represented by the decadent Spanish monarchy of the last Bourbons, however, the Napoleonic expansion and his intervention in the peninsula, the imposition of Jose Bonaparte as King of Spain, unleashed the patriotic response of the Spanish people known as the War of Independence. It was a heroic feat, but whose cost added to the loss of income for the independence of uh, American colonies gave the starting signal to a century of continuous conflicts and economic deterioration. To that convulsed and torn Spain was arriving Antonia to live in the court to move and coexist with the highest class in Spanish society during the time that is known as the moderate decade 1844 to 1854. Despite the term it was not characterized by being quiet and peaceful. The political spectrum was divided into several tendencies and positions. 
progressive, centralist, right wing, and they oscillated between a democratic left that called for universal suffrage and where an incipient workers movement was already shown as the most radical right, the Carlists. Despite the constant political disputes, the years of the moderate decade do not leave us entirely gloomy picture. They were years of some economic improvement, positive legal administrative changes. In 1843, Ferdinand 17th Harris, Isabel, had finally succeeded her father and crowned as Elizabeth II. She, she was sworn, sworn in as a constitutional queen. In 1844, the Civil Guard was created, and in 1847, the Spanish Bank of San Fernando. The tax system was simplified and improved, and with regard to education, the foundation of what in 1857 would be the Moyano law were laid. This Moyano law that was going to be promoted in 57 includes several important points. It makes it mandatory to observe education for girls, uh, the elementary education. It also pointed out that it wasn't so important if uh, the girls incomplete was left incomplete, but it was a great step. In addition, it established that uh, any population of uh, 500 plus inhabitants had to have a school. In those years, in 1850, illiteracy, the literacy rate was very high in Spain, but 80% of the women were illiterate so there's a difference uh, between men and women. And this for Antonia was always a main concern. In 1848, the railway that uh, joined Barcelona Mato was built and then Madrid to Aranjuez, we wanted to move forward and not stay outside of the progress uh, that was uh, happening in Europe. In that same year, 1848, a revolutionary climate spread throughout Europe. The economic growth resulting from the Industrial Revolution was charging the cost of labor exploitation and the unequal distribution of wealth and showed its darkest face with all crudeness. The discontent of the lower classes forgotten and protected by absent governments blind to the drama that was brewing, a new term was appearing the social issue. Two manifestos that would change the world were published. The best known, the communist one, contained a series of ideas that sought to put an end to the exploitation of workers and they made their proposals to establish a society where private property would disappear as well as the unequal and unjust division of labor. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Declaration of Sentiments was proclaimed. This document is better known as the Seneca Falls Declaration. This was the result of the meeting of 70 women and 30 men, activists of various movements, and of an ab abolitionist mood introduced, among others, the demand for political rights of women. And I quote, we decide that all laws which prevent women from occupying in society the position which their conscience dictates to them or which place them in an inferior position to that of men are contrary to the great precept of nature, therefore have no force or authority. In Spain from 1851, the tensions increased as well as the political instability that persisted due to a series of pronouncements in various points of the peninsula, such as Alicante, Lugo, and Madrid. In 1854, this became a real revolution. It was not a surprise, the political struggle between moderates, by the way, the party in which the mother of the Queen Doña Cristina had a considerable influence generating conflicts within the same party. And the progressives alternated in power thanks to a series of coup d'etat and created a deeply unstable political environment. It was then that General O'Donnell sought, sought a, a rapprochement with members of the progressive party 
to the already explosive political situation, there was also the intervention of other unprecedented actors, the workers, who not only demanded social, uh, social claimed a social position, popular groups and with their demands for work and better wages contributed to the movement, taking a more social and above all more complex aspect. The revolt began in Zaragoza. At first, it failed in the face of the repression, but the revolutionary spirit spread and General O'Donnell led the military uprising known as the Vilca Varada. The movement had characters of very of a great importance as General Serrano and Espartero. Finally, Queen Elizabeth II established the government of the so-called progressive Biennium. But the revolution of the Vicar Varada placed the Queen Mother in a very complicated situation. Her popularity had waned and she became the target of discontent. The Dukes of Rianzares inhabited the Palace of the Bars in Madrid, and the construction was the object of a popular anger and destroyed by a fire. This revolution would lead the Queen Mother and her family into exile in France, and they established their residence in Rueil in the Malmaison, property that had been of Josephine, the worst wife of Napoleon I, that Christina had acquired in 1848. Gone with Spain, not only for the family, but also for Antonia, who continued serving the Infantas. The years spent in the French exile from 1854 to 61 with the royal family were very fruitful in other aspects, such as in Antonia's intellectual development. The frequent trips, especially to Rome, allowed her to develop her literary inclination but these were also very rewarding years in terms of her deep religiosity. In 1855, she joined the Association of Daughters of Mary of the Sacred Heart. From her inclination to writing, she's left us a legacy that goes from poetry to travel notes, memories of London and an outing to Toledo, leaves from the Abon and her novels and many articles, but uh, I only quote the friend of the ladies. In 1861, Antonia's life again took an important change. She stopped being at the service of the Dukes of Rianzares and her work as a governess. And I complete this block to open my session of questions so that we can more or less clarify this uh, historical context in which Antonia lived her life. Thank you so much. We now invite participants to ask your questions either through the chat or by raising your hand. And a colleague from the commission will organize the questions and send them to Maria Lourdes so she can answer. We had uh, said that this time was going to be a little shorter than the second block because there would be some uh, questions and there would be more space for questions. We're all invited to ask questions. One question with regard to the situation of the women in the 19th century, at the end of that century. So what changes, what progress can we perceive today with regard to the century? You highlighted several points, but 
today, sometimes we feel that we're stepping back. How would you say, if there's a progress, what are those? Well, of course, we are in a situation where what we need to deconstruct is great. There are many centuries uh, uh, with an established uh, structure that defined the position of the woman of the men based on the capabilities. And that began in primitive world. The woman, is, uh, since she was the bearer of the, child, of the children, she's the one who has to stay. And that starts defining work. It marks the hierarchy of those who maintain or who are the providers and the woman is a receiver. But I think that in the 19th century, there's an important leap. We start recognizing that even in the area of occupations that uh, were marked by women, they do not imply the denial of the exercise of freedom of this woman. In fact, the men and women are a whole. And in that whole, I found a quote from the Middle Ages where we clearly see how for many centuries, the role of the woman had been assigned. In the seventh century about the agriculture, it says, uh, an agriculture has to have uh, a woman and uh, and the cow, and we see that the woman was a complement, was to complement the needs of the men. But at the same time, the contradiction also in that century is that the woman is a dep the repository of virtues and values. So the woman has to be protected, but at the same time, she's to be demanded a position. I think that the women are those who start opening their eyes and to say that despite there had certain characteristics that doesn't make us inferior to the masculine sex. We simply have a different position in this society. But destroying a patriarchal system requires a long time. And we see that in the 19th century. If the revolution and this first feminist started to think about the position of the woman. The first century of the century displayed a lot of regression. I think we started moving the situation and this generates uh, this and they start realizing that it's precisely the capabilities that women uh, can develop that can uh, unbalance the structure that was maintained from Sister Lourdes Pergamon the general superior of the oblates will share the theme of the movie if all the doors are shut hi well thank you manuel thank you to the commission for the bicentennial for this moment this is the advertisement moment i'm happy that we can actually say hello during this uh, advertising break in this day that is very promising. We've started with a very suggestive content. I just wanted to mention that I think that most of us know that we are embarked uh, in a very interesting project, which is a movie. It's an initiative uh, that was uh, uh, kind of uh, buzzing for years. And as we approached the bicentennial, we wanted to truly take up this proposal. And after discussing it with the provincial teams and with their support, we launched into this project. I think that it's important to say that ultimately the objective behind this the desire is precisely what tomorrow the bicentennial invites us to celebrate that is the life of mother Antonia and to make her known as the great woman that she is and we're seeing these new nuances that I think are beautiful information 
we wanted a movie that would just not be autobiographical, but that through the movie we could show something that does uh, that we expressed these days to show say that her legacy her message is still current and that uh, Antonia is still a reference for today I don't know whether Rosalie can show so the movie is a story that intertwines the life of three great women one of course is mother Antonia but then another woman who's a victim uh, of human trafficking in the, the 21st century. So we're talking about different times. Sharik, one of the protagonists in the life of a, of a restless young woman. And I think that we can identify with her. Many of us who are here at our different stages, a restless woman in a search. And as a, she gets in touch with the reality of prostitution. And when she meets the Oblates, she go, undergoes a process of transformation like Antonia's. As far as the this movie, these are movies, uh, these are images from this movie. During June and July, we already filmed this uh, movie and in very important stage. And now we are in post-production it's a more internal stage, but also important and necessary. We hope we can um, project this meeting during uh, the meeting that we'll have to close this bicentennial. We'll hear some details tomorrow. And uh, if we participate to this meeting, we may project it, we may show it, but we also want it to go to the movie theaters uh, in as many countries as possible. So that may take a little longer. We'll see what the appropriate time is uh, to send it to the theaters. Well, we're happy to say that this dream is becoming a reality. So we want, I want to thank uh, all those who are making this possible. And I want to say that we still rely on further support so that we can make it uh, possible to the end. It's a costly project. Many people have already made a contribution and I'm sure we'll receive uh, uh, more contribution. At the end of the video, you'll see some details about how to do this, but also on our website, hermanasoblatas.org, uh, you can see how you can make contributions. So thanks again. And now Rosel is going to show us another video. The second teaser, it's a very brief video. Consider that that's uh, what we've been able to present so far, but we hope that at least uh, that uh, we can see two scenes from this uh, movie. One about this uh, current uh, times uh, with the woman involved in prost prostitution and from the times. Uh, of two centuries ago.
Thank you so much, Lourdes. <clears throat> Thank you so much. We're very glad to see this preview. Now we once again give the floor to Maria Lourdes with her second part. Well, we're back. The scene from this uh, movie that we saw, I think, will make us understand uh, Antonia's life, the contrast in Antonia's life, the two scenes that we saw showing us such different and distant realities, but somehow they show us that courage in Antonia, because when we see those girls in that refined and clean and perfect environment, and which Antonia leaves uh, to commit to the other, had we planned the scene, it would have been perfect. We're going to perfectly well understand the hesitations and Antonia's courage to change, not only her activity, but also to change herself within in order to change, and more than change to help others change. So, it was great to see that scene. So we left Antonia precisely as she completed, she finished that time in her life, that relaxed time, that clean time. And Antonia has to make very important decisions. What is it that causes the Antonia's change? It's caused by the marriage of Christina the youngest daughter of the Dukes in October of 1860. The marriage of Cristina ended Antonia's life in the family environment of the Spanish royalty and her work as a governess. Important decisions had to be made after some time in Switzerland, she decides to move to Rome, beginning a new stage in her life. She already knew the city and she led a simple life dedicated to study, writing, and that's when she finishes two of her novels, Rosal de la Magdalena and Aurelio, but she also dedicated her time in helping others. And soon she was associated to the apostolic work. She was attracted to this by the Benedictine Jose Serra. She, it was conceded to a uh, holy to, it has been granted to holy and zealous missionary to make known and love among us in Rome, the apostolic woman to inflame our hearts with a holy and noble enthusiasm of the missionary Bishop Serra, well known in Spain, as she says. This work had to remedy the material needs of the missionaries, Father Serra, without knowing it, Antonia would be fundamental in the new direction of her life when once again their circumstances reunited them in Madrid in 1863 and she, she recognized uh, him as the man of providence to direct her soul and lead God and lead her to God. Rome was not Antonia's final destination. By the end of 1862 she had decided to return to Spain to reunite with her relatives. She arrived in Madrid in 1863 and settled in the house that her uncle, the general of Pesuela, had in the street of Serrano. Antonia's life continued between her hours dedicated to helping others, her work in the apostolic work, and her stays in Las Avellanas, a property of her family in Catalonia. Father Serra was one of the many guests to rest in the house of Antonia's family. After a few days of rest, he returned to his work in Madrid, and one consisted in attending at the hospital of San Juan de Dios to exercise the priestly ministry among the many patients. And even among the wretched young women whom their dissolute life had prostrated on the bed of pain within this famous establishment. 
it is logical to think that Antonia was aware of the activities of Father Serra and she felt great admiration for him, but how far she was from imagining the turn her life would take very soon, encouraged by the priest. And this would take her from her protected and kind world where she had lived to descend and touch with her eyes and heart in the first person, the depth of pain, injustice, and marginalization. Father Serra, aware of the terrible situations of these women whom he intended to relieve, realized that the time spent in the hospital was not enough, that it was necessary to find the spaces where when leaving the hospital, they could recover and persevere in their good purposes. Thanks to the prelate's contact with the terrible condition of those poor women, and in the face of the difficulty of uh, guaranteeing a suitable place for them when leaving the hospital because of the scarcity of these places or because of the restrictions for their admissions, in her spirit, she, uh, conceives as I, asylums that are capable of welcoming them and allowing them to continue on their recovery. In Spain and in the, the colonies, there were the houses of um, recollection, but there were also other institutions in Spain, such as the one founded for these uh, young women, for example, the Viscountess, but they existed, but it was very difficult to find a space the father was really concerned about the situation of these women, and he thought that he could found these asylums. That is when Antonia seems uh, ideal to the father for this task. What virtues did he see in this woman? According to Mr. Rubio's uh, description of front of Antonia, she had lived uh, in a world that was totally alien to that painful reality. How could uh, she devote herself to such a difficult task? Nothing could be further for the life of one or, or another. Antonia was a woman who lived well with no hardship or no nor luxuries, but she was independent. She related to kings and princesses and she kept in touch with them. She was in touch with prelates and she, she had even been presented to the Pope. It is clear that she's a cultured and refined uh, woman Mr. Rubio says she was literate and writes and prints things in prose and verse that are read and applauded there and in France. Her life has had been spent mostly in palaces, in luxuries, and in the royal family as the, the governess of the Infantas in the, the highest uh, environments. She had traveled to important cities. She possessed great spirituality and a religious inclination. However, she received uh, several marriage proposals and one of them from a count that would have assured her a life free of hardships. But Father Serra was convinced of Antonia's virtues and that by counting on her and giving her maturity, these poor women could be saved from the mud. The bishop was a man involved in work. He had he mastered the word and had a great ability of conviction. So he suggested this project to Antonia. What went through the head and heart of Miss de Oviedo in the face of such a proposal? Antonia hesitated. She was afraid of the magnitude of this idea. And she even felt repugnance and lack of experience. She was an educator, yes, but within a refined environment in the midst of a world that was alien to human miseries, aware of the needs of people. We see it in her vocation of service, but very far from the reality that awaited her. We can assume that these were difficult days on the one hand, we had the bishop that she admired so much. On the other hand, her feeling regarding that reality and the opposition of her uncles and her friends, the, the Rubios who pointed out the inconveniences 
that of putting Antonia in front of sinful and penitent women or sisters or nuns when she was neither one or the other. But Father Serra was sure that Antonia could face this enormous challenge and convinced her. And if all the doors are closed to these unfortunates, I will open them some where they can be saved. I'll ask for alms, I'll do all I can. If no one helps me, I will do it alone with the grace and support of those who carried on his shoulder the lost sheep and does not want the death of the sinner, but uh, that he be converted and live. Could Antonia have resisted uh, this statement from her spiritual guide? Although he pro she proposes to help uh, these uh, manner indirectly and do everything possible, even if it disgusts me, Antonia finally, and despite her hesitations, made the decision that would change her life, leave everything to find everything. After mature reflections, long prayers, and violent fighting, as well as a special grace from Our Lady of the Good Council, I finally decide to embrace the beautiful but hard and difficult mission of working for the liberation of those poor women. It wouldn't be easy to start this work. The rejection of his closed circle was evident and the lack of resources among others, but nothing would stop her will in Antonia's spirit. Father Serra had accomplished his task. The convinced convince. Antonia had made her decision and soon after in 1864, the asylum was established near Madrid in San Pozuelos. It would welcome those women eager to redirect their lives. They were expelled from other places and there would be no restrictions, uh, age, nationality, illness, or recidivism. The maxim of forgiveness would be fulfilled as many times as necessary, 70 times seven. The asylum sought to offer repentant women not only protection, but to be a true port of salvation. With respect, love, and patience, they would be taken by the hand in their spiritual life and with the development of their skills on the path of a dignified and honest life in society. A dream was beginning, a utopia to achieve the regeneration of those women who for different reasons had descended into a dark world with no hope, ignored and despised at the same time to help them out of the harsh existence in which they lived. And like any utopia, to make it a reality, a lot of work had to be done. But let's leave Antonia in the difficult years of the beginning and let's return to the situation in the peninsula. Spain from 1864 to 98. 1863 Three was when Antonia returned to the peninsula. That year, we already perceived the end of a time of some political calm, of economic growth and greater activity in the international field. The War of Africa, 56 to 60, the intervention in Mexico, 1860 to 61. But the precarious stability would not last, and the fall of the government of Leopoldo Donald and the Liberal Union Party was evident. There was an evident decomposition of the political system. To add it to the unpopularity of Queen Elizabeth due to her disorderly and scandalous sentimental life, Madrid was burned with poverty and luxury. Its inhabitants were mixed in the narrow streets of the most interclasses European capital. The moral discredit of the queen contributed to the discredit of the crown and even the monarchy. In an increasingly rarefied environment, the recurrent instability that had characterized the century was once again revealed, followed by a series of moderate party governments. Discontent grew and the, the repression increased in the face of these demonstrations. One of the most representative events that took place in 1865. It was called the first student issue in the Europe in Europe of this 19th century, all the problems, uh, common problems were called the question or the issue that could be attended to 
among the powers or in a society, it was called the question. So that's why we have the Ottoman question, the social question, the student question. It was a specific problem that transcended everyday problems. This uh, student question culminated in the Nate night of St. Daniel or the slaughterhouse one to stifle the support of the students of the rector of the University of Madrid. The civil guard and the army corps repressed the students with great violence and bloodshed in the square of the, the Plaza del Sol. Why did the rector need the support of students? Because he was opposed to the order of the government to destitute Mr. Emilio Castellar from his work at the university for having published two articles in the newspaper that censored and spoke of uh, Queen Elizabeth. We see how go the government is recurring to the repression of the ideas, to the growing discontent, not only the in the political sphere, but also academic and popular, we also experienced the economic crisis of 1866. The political path to access power is narrowed. And there was the idea among oppon opponents of the government of the path of insurrection to achieve it. In January of that year, General Prim took up arms and in July, the Cuartel de San Gil. Progressives and Democrats met and signed the path Pact of Ostend in August, whose slogan would be the overthrow of Queen Elizabeth. In September 1868, when, uh, the, when after the cry of Borbones and Viva España, real revolution broke out, grouping the interests of several political groups, the army, the people, headed by Prim himself. With the triumph of the, of the revolution, the queen and her family were exiled in Napoleon III's France. He took up residence in taking up residence in Paris that would be called the Palace of Castile, where in 1870, the queen abdicated the throne, ceding her the rights to her firstborn Alfonso, where the queen would die in 1904. A new stage began the democratic sexenium, and in 1869, a new constitution was established to, of a liberal nature, endorsing fundamental rights and including the right to vote for all citizens, males aged 25, the division of powers, and established a constitutional monarchy as a form of government. And here in Spain, we're facing another problem. Several prospects, there were several prospects for the throne of Spain, generating uh, various positions in political groups. On the one hand, there was the Bourbon heir, Alfonso, son of the dethroned queen and Francis of Assisi. Alfonso was barely 12 years old and did not have the support of most of the revolutionary leaders who wanted the change of dynasty. Of course, there was uh, the usual Carlist uh, suitor, Don Carlos Isidro de Borbon. On the other hand, General Prim, Chancellor Sagasta, opted for a member of the House of Savoy, the Duke of Aosta. Why bring out the House of Savoy? That was not so since the end of the War of Secession in the 18th century. It had been established that the dynasty Bourbon could uh, gain access to the throne if they did not the, the one in Habsburg and in case they did not the House of Savoy. So there was that reference. So Prim and Sagasta see in the House of uh, Savoy an important element for a more stable government. But there are other issues within the framework of the international conjuncture. The succession of the throne of Spain was handled as a fundamental element for the interests of Bismarck's policy on the way to the unity of the German states in a single political entity for Prussia. The last step in achieving the goal was to provoke a war with France, which would contribute to exalting nationalist sentiments in the southern German states, so they would join Prussia. So from the Prussian political circle, the candidacy of a member of the Prussian House of Hohenzoll 
Hohen Zollenso was promoted. And according to Bismarck's uh, forecast, would provoke a reaction of the French that did not want a German prince uh, on the Spanish throne as well as Prussian. This, uh, this anticipation of Bismarck, in fact, uh, became true. This was one of the important uh, causes of the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. In Spain, we needed to give a prompt solution to this decision. And in the midst of a tense political environment, the liberal, progressive, and democratic union parties wishing to constitutionally legitimize power and united to contain the interests of both Carlists of extreme right and Republicans finally decided to offer the crown of the kingdom to the pretender of the House of Savoy, the Duke of Aosta and future Amadeus I. It would be a bad omen for the new government, uh, but, but a bad omen would be the crime that shook the political class uh, and society. Even before the arrival of the new king, there was the assassination of General Prim, who had been a firm supporter of the Savoy House. The following years uh, were not easy after the revolution of the 68. In politics, clashes between various positions did not cease, and, and there was a constant uh, growing republicanism and the rise of the socialist ideology that was um, producing more problems, in addition to the penetration of anarch anarchism, colonial problems, especially in the Caribbean and Cuba, and further complicating the picture, the economic aspect, Spain could not uh, take off and faced a serious budget deficit and growing debt. All of the above would be enough to understand the failure of uh, the reign of Amadeus I. But for some scholars, it weighed even, it was even uh, more cumbersome to, to consider the impossibility of articulating a coherent system of parties. Since the reign of Amadeo could not be consolidated, the strength of the government coalition was diluted as the social tension increased. The Carlist pressure would soon turn into an armed uprising. The so-called Third Carlist War. Government succeeded in a real carousel. Sagasta, Topete, Serrano, Ruiz, Sorrilla. They were unable to restore the consensus given in 68. The political atmosphere was more and more poisoned and it seemed like an all against all struggle. Even the king suffered an attack in 1872. In a letter, the queen wrote to Antonia, the queen from Paris wrote to Antonia, God willing to take pity on Spain, always so unhappy. There's a series of of sentences and these letters exchanged between Antonia, the queen and the Infantas. There's a continuous relation of asking for prayers for this Spain that is uh, undergoing so many problems. Antonia is constantly writing these sentences, uh, speaking of the existing concern in the reign. Finally, the king abdicated on February 11th, 1873, and as soon as he left for Portugal, the Republic was proclaimed. Also, the first uh, Spanish Republic would, would have a sad fate and ended up being defeated by a military uprising in December 1874. In January of the following year, Francisco Serrano was at the head of the executive branch. It was a dictatorship that tried to put order in the prevailing Spanish anarchy. A coup d'etat put an end to the first Republican experiment in Spain, opening the door to the restoration of the monarchy and the return of the Bourbon House. The heir, Alfonso, was proclaimed the king and arrived in Madrid in 1875. The new king met Spain again in the middle of an armed conflict, the third Carlist War, and he managed to put an end by scoring the first of his triumphs. Alfonso's objective was, the, was peace in the country. And another important achievement was the signature, the, the respite in Cuba with the signing of the Peace of San Juan. 
Cuba was the jewel that was left to the Spanish crown and the Caribbean. Cuba had attempted its independence in the 19th century. There was a war of the 10 years that put an end, came to an end to the Peace of San Juan when the liberating Cuban army capitulates before the Spanish troops. This gave a big rest to Spain from a military and um, economic uh, and economic uh, aspect. It was a it was very costly to maintain this war. Antonio Canos was a key figure. He managed to provide Spain with a liberal system, not democratic, stable, and lasting after the convulsive years of the revolutionary period. Reconciliation was sought and the conservative party with Canovas at the, the head and the liberal party with Sagasta were founded. We moved into a time when the two options would take turns in power peacefully stability among political groups, although corruption proliferated, influenced the Spanish society and the indifference and political demobilization among the population spread. From 1875 to 98, the year of the death of Antonia Maria de la Misericordia and at the, be the beginning of the Spanish-American War, Alfonso XII reigned in Spain until 1885, the year of his death, and his son, the future Alfonso XIII, came of age. His mother, Maria Cristina, reigned as a regent. Let's now come back to 1864 and the foundation of the Asylum of Cienposuelos, Port of Salvation to Shipwreck Out, also school of virtue to the vicious and workshop of industry of the for the ignorant. On July 1st, 1864, in Cienposuelos, in a small rented house, Antonia says only four humble walls and with the authorization, both of the Archbishop of Toledo and the civil authority, a work began of which today, that today we celebrate. Antonia and her companion loneliness, as she says, faced a reality from that was always unknown. Her life had been in a totally different environment where she was devoted to educating virtuous women, those who despite they were subordinate to men and considered in perpetual minority and whose main virtues were to be obedience, respect, self-denial and sacrifice lived under the protective mantle of men for though, and although this situation was slowly beginning to change, only an education aimed at perfecting those virtues natural to the sex uh, and being a good daughter, wife and mother was considered necessary. But there were the other women, the sinners, the prostitutes, the one who sold, who sold themselves. Antonio left that virtuous world to approach the reality of those we could call the female lumpen, those who lived in the midst of degradation and corrupted by vice. Antonia says, this is a sentence of hers, a woman, a young woman abandoned to her own fate, forgotten by men without protection, without consolation, without a future, without hope, resorts to her soul and exclusive property. She is sold to improve her lot. Women who in clear contradiction were on the one hand invisible, they're not talked about, but they exist. And on the other, they fulfill the function of satisfying the needs of men beyond the purity of the conjugal bad acting, as Mario Lopez Martinez says, as a buffer of social tensions and even benefactor with respect to bourgeois marriage. Antonia enmaced herself in that harsh reality for which she resorted to her discipline, generous character, her education, her inclination to service, and the wise and loving advice of her mother treasured in her heart and her letters that she preserved forever. All of this permeated by a deep spirituality and closeness to a loving and forgiving God. She would put everything at the service of the work she undertook, for which she would develop a pedagogy to fulfill 
the mission that had been imposed, uh, that she would dedicate herself uh, for all her life. The recovery of these women, his, her, their souls and body, attracting them to a dignified life through love, respect, and patience. Brothels and therefore prostitutes were a public problem in several respects. On the one hand, with regard to health and hygiene, they were seen as transmitters of terrible and shameful diseases, of course, uh, the venereal ones, but there were others that were often associated to them, such as TB. That is why it was important to attend to this situation. It was in the hospital San Juan de Dios where Father Cerro was shocked by the heartbreaking spectacle he contemplated more with the eyes of the soul than those of the body. The life of those unhappy women alternated between brothel and hospital from which in most cases, those who achieved their cure returned to the previous situation. Another problem was about uh, public order. On several occasions, brothels were spaces where order was altered, especially given the marginal conditions in the slums where exclusion, poverty, helplessness, and ignorance were constant ingredients. Of course, we cannot leave aside the moral question. Houses harmful to public morality. The morality of these women was subordinated to the needs to survive in the face of social rejection for various reasons, loss of honor, poverty, orphanhood, or even widowhood. Prostitution could be the only way of economic solution always open to those women questioned in the moral aspect, but, but a part, a very important part in its mercantile part since it's a branch of commerce that supports large part of the population. The attitude in the face of these problems uh, changed, uh, from, fluctuated from periods of denial of its existence uh, from society and authorities and in others, as in the case of the second half of the 19th century, of trying to regulate it since prostitution was a habitual practice of single male groups or rite of passage for young people. Prostitution was an integral part of the sexual space of Hispanic men. But there's another dimension for prostitutes and that is the art the forgotten beings, despised, tolerated beings appear in artistic works of great universal value, value. And I will only point a few. How can we forget Fantine in Les Miserables or Santa in, uh, in Joaquin Gam of Joaquin Gamboa and of course Violeta, the protagonist of The Lady of the Camellia by Dumas brought to music by Verdi in La Traviata or those who were models of Caravaggio no less that representing virgins, reviled, despised, exploited, but at the but at the end of the day, they were present. The lives of these women traveled through history from earliest uh, times to the present. There were some institutions that sought to attend to these women, such as the Casa de Recogida where the women of bad living were imprisoned, but in the opinion of Father Serra, they did not solve the problems because upon leaving the hospitals, they had nowhere to go nor means to get out of their situation. Their helplessness were very, was very great. Another worthy effort of attention to these people was that of the Viscountess of Horvalands a contemporary of Artonia and founder of the religious adorers and slaves of the Blessed Sacrament and Charity. In 1845, they established the House of Mary Most Holy of the Forsaken to receive women victims of prostitution and help them get out of that life. It was not an easy task, that of Antonia. Once the house was rented, it had to be arranged uh, to receive these repentance and hands and resources were few. But despite this, and thanks to the tenacity of Antonia and Fado Serra and the financial help of several people like the Rubio and others, the Asylum of Cien Pozuelos opened its doors to the first two penitents. A year after after it was founded in the street of Jardines, it was clear that the space was insufficient 
and they were offered the opportunity to acquire an old Franciscan convent on the outskirts of town. And thanks uh, to this being uh, on a public auction, it could be acquired. But it was not just, but lack of space was not the only obstacle. But uh, as for the people to attend to, the founders, uh, the founders saw it as an alternative to resort to the help of religious institutions. And of all those they had in mind, the most appropriate was the newly founded by Father Jose Tu, a Franciscan tertiary nuns whose main function was teaching girls of modest classes. That institute accepted, accepted the, this petition as long as they could establish their own college. However, the stay of these nuns came to an end. There were more problems beyond the school, but they did not comply with the profile that Antonia required for the attention to these women. Father Serra and Antonia were persuaded once more of the inescapable need for a new congregation, which organized in accordance with the objective proposed in the asylum would ensure the complete success of the work of regeneration that they had begun. Very difficult years followed. Beginnings are never easy. The country once again was in the midst of political turbulence that led to the dethronement of Queen Elizabeth, everything we said before. Spain was living a very complicated time. And in addition, there was a terrible financial situation that affected the asylum since donations decreased. And to crown such a picture, a voracious fire reduced to ashes the roof and upper part of the convent. Thanks to the unwavering will of Antonio and Father Serra, the asylum survived. It was even possible to establish the institute that they desires. We can see it that what, with the taking of the habit of Antonia in Trinidad on February 2nd, 1870. And that begins the second phase of the Asylum of Our Lady of Consolation that had already become a religious community. Antonia took a big step. She managed to fulfill a long cherished dream to dedicate her life completely to the service of God. Not only would the asylum continue but the congregation of the Oblate Sisters of the Most Holy Redeemer, Daughters of St. Lawrence of Liguori, in fact, and in law, was established. Antonia professed on March 25th, 1873, and she took the name of Sister Antonia Maria of Mercy, pronouncing the vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty in her fourth vow, in where she consecrates herself to the moralization of repentant women to take care of the salvation of sinners. This fourth vow disappeared by order of the Pope in 1881. The clarity with which we understood the great challenges required a scrupulous care regarding the aptitudes of the aspirants to enter the congregation. They had to be very aware of the huge task they had to carry out and what and they were re required full disposition for all kinds of work, sorrows and dislikes to truly be useful to the penitents, good health, activity, intelligence, regular instruction, zeal, patience, continuous and complete self-denial. This speaks of Antonia's character. She demanded that from herself and she knew it was necessary to carry out such a work. The congregation prospered and its work was rewarded in the establishment of new asylums. And by 1876, 12 had been founded. But what was the charism of this work? How did Antonia manage to approach those women? Uh, Antonia, her sensitivity, empathy, understanding, and magisterial vein come together and put themselves at the service of this project. The lives of these women was not easy and they developed a deep distrust of a world that was often hostile. Their pain encapsulated in their depth turned them into beings that responded with fear, e even aggressiveness as a form of protection. Antonia perceives their condition as, uh, 
wounded beings used in order to establish contact with them and to extend her hand to live to leave that misery not economic but human we had to offer them the heart she saw god himself in the midst of that human tragedy the redeeming compassionate god the one who puts pain in his heart, the Christ who purged human failures on the cross, who comforts those who suffer and welcomes the repentant. Antonia knew that the road would be hard, but that dedicating her life to penitence and opening a space for hope was to follow, was to follow the route marked by God, a mission always reserved for her. A method was necessary. There was a need for a pedagogy based on the reality of the person it was addressed. It was them, the girls, who expressed their needs. It required great willingness and disposition to not impose, but rather understand and act accordingly. At the basis of all pedagogy that Antonia said there had to be love, love as a result of respect and acceptance. Only with this attitude can we achieve the objective of their reconstruction, save them and rescue them from, for the Lord with a salvation that covers the entire person and tries to and seeks their human rehabilitation and reinsertion into society. It was not just about protection. In many cases, it could be urgent, but temporary. It was about rescuing them through a series of steps so, so that it was lasting. Individual attention, uh, loving and careful and patient, but firm. Demolish a past to build a future through a, plan, a formation plan with knowledge. Strengthen the, their will with the creation of habits, discipline, and values, such as work, order, cleanliness but all with great patience and above all respecting their times. All of the above required from the Oblate sisters very solid virtues and the total acceptance of God's plan, the rehabilitation of each of the repentant women. The function of the sisters was to become true mothers and teachers, to accompany them, to guide them with a loving selflessness of uh, the one who loves and welcome these poor helpless beings somehow untamed accustomed to having no other law than theirs reaching the goal would not be an easy task it requires a lot of effort work and tenacity that is why it is important that when knocking down each obstacle, no matter how small or large, stimuli are given, prizes to the fulfillment of intermediate goals to withstand the difficult challenge. And that is the result of the walls that are being broken down. For the work with the girls, as Antonia calls them to be successful, it was essential that they entered the asylum of their own free will. Antonia claims the right of these women, women to chose their path and choose a dignified life, rejecting the perception of good and generous people of the impossibility of their redemption. Magdalene women who will never be good for society and God only knows if they can save their souls. Antonia was aware that repentance was the, was the first step and that her true reconstruction will be the fruit of much effort, love, and patience, a daily and constant struggle, and that the support of sisters was fundamental. They've broken the chain of vice, yes, but not the threads that keep them imprisoned, uh, rendering uh, useless the good feelings. Uh, we must cut these threads little by little without hurting the sick part with affection and heroism. It was a fine work, like embroidering, opening layers of protection with which they've locked their aching hearts to penetrate it, to help them without ruling out that when there's a need to reprimand them, this wake-up call was made up with kindness and affection. Antonia is not deceived uh, in the face of this huge mission. She was a woman with her heart in God and her feet on the ground. She knows the reality, that raw and painful reality. And what's most important, it was about teaching that 
it was that a different different life was possible for them too. Since personal contact is very important, the work would be done in small groups where the previous life of each one would be left out to facilitate the approach to the knowledge of religion and its values, making space for the learning of skills and knowledge useful to daily life, such as reading and writing the accounts. And thanks to the closeness with them, to the discovery of their own abilities and the promote the development of capacities that when the time comes would allow them to start a new life more in accordance with morality. I would, I would sound, of course, this process would include the tasks of their sex, that is uh, uh, washing, ironing, sewing, cooking, even cultivating a garden, taking care of uh, domestic animals, these latter teachings would allow the possibility of finding decent work in domestic service, perhaps but also once they left the asylum. In the asylums, all those repentant women who sought, who sought it would be received without distinction of any kind or condition. And in the case they had abandoned them and wanted to return and they would be accepted 70 times seven if necessary. Antonia Mary of the Mercy undertook the search for utopia to achieve salvation, the improvement of the lives of these women by transforming their reality. We must never confuse the difficulty of achieving the dream with the impossibility of doing it. Antonia knew it. She faced great challenges, obstacles, obstacles that seem unsurmountable, and despite it all, she succeeded. Manuela told me that uh, She's going to complete this block and then I do the conclusion. We finished a little earlier, but anyhow, if you agree, we can take this space for questions questions to deepen more what was left pending from the other part so that we can then uh, read the conclusion and then we can close the day. So we are now invited to ask any questions uh, whether through the chat or by raising your hand as we said before. Priscilla is collecting the questions so that Lourdes can respond. As you think about the questions, I will give you the two questions from the previous block. In what sense can we consider Antonia as an agent of change? And do you think that if Antonia had gotten married, she would have stopped her mission and vision. In what sense is Antonia an agent of change? She's an agent of change because she generates a change. There's a change in the perception of this of these women. There's a change in the perception of uh, this satin of these stigmatizing these women this leads us to the origin of the situation it is very clear we understand it today we understand that in her lifestyle she is uh, bringing out the two major problems that still exist one the cause uh, uh, the origin of the situation of these women is based is a patriarchal structure that defines women as an object she's an agent of change because she goes to the origin of this perception of the woman within a specific structure that that function is working in society this process is very slow 
we see it today, 150 years later, it's easy for us to define how she exactly perceives that. But on the other hand, I see that Antonia is very clear in defining that the situation of uh, marginality, of poverty, of exclusion is also the origin of the causes that uh, place the woman at the level of an object when she says that the only property they have is what they use to survive. She's telling us clearly that the social issue in addition to the patriarchy are the origins of this major problem that uh, objectifies the woman. If we, Antonia is not an activist of her time. She's not the Mary Wilson Craft who launches into something. She's not um, Olympia Bush. She's a woman of life. We see her, we perceive her, so we understand and we continue understanding. And that's uh, the enormity of her work. The problems have been diagnosed. What needs to be done is to find the solution in a structure that objectifies and uses the woman to achieve a role of someone who is placed above that and that situation needs to be removed just as a situation of poverty and marg and margin and the marginalization that still exists. I think that we can consider in this perspective Antonia as a woman who's not only an agent of change but a deep change that is still in process in progress. We don't know if we can actually eradicate at least let's uh, be let's be faithful and let's hope that these structures will come to an end and that the societies will be more equal but the social issue this the issue of marginalization the issue of uh, an excessive uh, appreciation of the power granted by the financial position objectifying people on this path. In this perspective, I think that she is a woman of change. The other question, what if Antonia had gotten married? Well, I'm going to apply my mind as a historian. In history, there's no what if. Ooh. Uh, what we have is what existed. If an, that Antonia would have uh, continued dedicating her her life to the social question, I think that she would have continued that whether she was married or not, she would have not limited herself. But we have to move back in time here. It's very difficult for Antonia having a, a home, a husband, children, a social position because she would have kept a specific social position. It would have been very difficult for her to be engaged in this uh, mistreated sector of society. I think that in that sense, not because of her, but Father Serra would have never da dared to propose uh, a work of this type to a married woman, I think that time, the area would not allow it, the context would not have allowed her to devote herself to that. Certainly, I don't doubt she would have uh, still been engaged in uh, an area of service. She was a woman of service, but I don't think she would have been able to get into the asylums of a penit a repentant woman. It would have been a, ex an extraordinary breakthrough. Two questions together, I think they can be linked. What are the, indi the differential indicators between the charism of the congregation that Antonia establishes as with respect to other contemporary uh, congregations dedicated to the women. The other question, can you describe what was the pedagogy or the path of transformation offered by Antonia in the asylum? 
and then I have two more. How can we compare? I think that tomorrow Pere is going to talk to you about different institutions. I've really been in contact with institutions of the government type that exist for abused women. And as far as orders, I really know yours. The difference that I see as compared to the ones that existed in the 19th century, the collection houses or some that opened their doors to these women. I think that this is precisely based on the idea of Antonia to demolish, to build, to really give them the opportunity so that these women could decide what they wanted to do with their lives. Antonia is a woman who doesn't uh, judge, she doesn't stigmatize, and she gives them full freedom to choose what she's offering them. And I think that that is uh, the great change. It's not just to protect them in time, but not to give them tools. That's connected to the second one. It is fundamental for pedagogy and the treatment of these women to enable them to be able to make decisions. I think that this is the great value of Antonia's pedagogy. It is the distinction that I see as compared to what existed at the time. It is, it is not just to help, it's about asking what it is they need and adjust to what they need. When I was preparing this presentation, I consulted uh, uh, even interviews, not just the books that Manuela sent to me. I went to search for more information and I found an interview of Sister Carmen in the in Mexico, in Mexico City. In that interview, there was something that struck me that I can mention here because I think that that's where the second answer lies. In one question, they said, well, sisters, how can you, how do you get to meet these women? And they said, we open our doors and we ask them, what do you need? Do you need us to take care of your children? Do you need us to give you workshops? Do you need spaces of joy, spaces for relaxation, spaces to feel like a person? And I think that that is Antonia's secret. If I could define Antonia and her entire pedagogy, we can say workshops of all kinds, beauty, cooking, whatever. Antonia's importance is that ever since they set a foot in an asylum, they recover their status as a person, a full person, a person who decides the person who can aspire to something more. So of course, the whole pedagogy that she develops is in order to allow them this. So of course, education, writing, to make them to, to learn to take care of pets, work, discipline, hygiene, everything, to put everything at the service of showing them a path and accompanying them to become human beings with dignity for themselves. Antonia doesn't question. That's one of the things. Now that I approached her in our conversation that we had in preparing this, I told Marisa that knowing Antonia was falling in love with her. And I feel that that is the charism of Antonia she molds it in a pedagogy, yes, in practical things, of course, but it would not make sense unless it touched the depth of the heart of these people to allow them to see themselves as a full person, a capable person. As we could see in some in response to the pedagogy, whether they study, don't study, if they stand up or not, everything is in the second uh, is a second step. It's about generating an appropriate um, environment to recover. That would be the Antonia that I celebrate today. 
Isabel is resonating uh, with your answer and she says that that's exactly how we work with these women and she says that the and those projects and they say that in those projects they feel like people like persons two other questions one related to politics and this political condition uh, that you presented this situation in the 19th century we can understand that antonia did the political advocacy and if so how and what was the position and the relation of the catholic hierarchy and the church community with regard to prostitution in the 19th century do you think we inherited something from that position or relation of course, it's obvious uh, since when something gets into a moral judgment about what's wrong and right, whatever religion have, whatever, all the religions have to take a position. The issue here is that we are part of a historical context. When we talk about the church or Catholics or any other religion, we have to understand that they live in a specific time. If we step out of that, if we step out of that time, and if us, the Christians or Catholics in my case, if I go to the gospel and I see Jesus, I understand that there's no difference in people for him. We are those who create institutions, who set limits. We feel like, definers of what's right and wrong, we forget the essence and the foundation of what we say and what we believe. Jesus made no distinction among people. Jesus always saw the people. The term Magdalene that is used to define the women of uh, bad life, for him, that difference did not exist for him. They were sinners, because of circumstances of definition and he welcomes them into his heart. So the churches take positions and oftentimes based on the circumstances. When I read that quote, that is that prostitution somehow responded to a need as a social buffer since the several groups of single people. We have, for example, the militaries but also the church people, people who supposedly lived in celibacy. Does that make them bad people? No, that's the idea of religion. But when you have to set a limit or tell someone this is your path, you have to define what's around them. So sometimes you take positions. Now, with regard to Antonia's position, with regard to politics, she's always concerned about politics the events, she's a woman of the world, the events affect her, affect her directly. We can simply think that Antonia, of course, was favorable to the Bourbon dynasty. I don't know the natural contact with the family of the Bourbons and not Aosta, but Antonia Sonia is not a woman who limits her life to politics. She suffers the conditions of the context, but she doesn't expect to change that context, uh, if not in what pertains to her. Clearly, oftentimes she says in her letters, the situation is terrible, pray for our poor Spain, there are conflicts. She does say that, but she's so clear as to her objectives and mission. She sees this. Um, we have to understand that the Spanish 19th century and the one that we inherited is chaotic. It is a century of constant instability, uh, financial problems, change of powers, uh, wars, extreme positions. I did find some position with regard to Carlism as something being more right wing, but with a tendency to absolute, ab absolutism and traditional values. But I did not 
find at any time in everything I read, a clear position of, um, of Antonia with regard to what happened, rather suffering and what has had happened. I don't know if my answer was clear. The, there's a person who asked, the person who raised this question could perhaps say whether the answer was clear. Any other question, any comment in the chat? No, there are no further questions. They ask whether she can share the text. Of course, of course, of course. And we're going to upload it onto the webpage. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. So once again, we thank Lourdes for accepting this challenge to share her richness as a historian about Antonia, a woman of her century committed to change and a woman who leaves some uh, prints to follow, some footprints, as Lourdes said, and we too must reflect on this. And she does this through her charism and mission that she devotes to with all her being highlighting the style of Jesus in the person that he sees that, that he doesn't see beyond the, that person. And then with her changes, as, as all of us, we are in a patriarchal society, a sexist society, a discriminating society, and we need to go through the processes of removing all these <clears throat> all these preconceived judgment. Antonia did this, she reached this point, and that is the challenge that each of us is left with. So we're going to invite you now to uh, give us a final conclusion after your presentation. We thank you wholeheartedly once more. So you have the floor again. Well, by way of conclusion, I can say that I found a woman true to herself, to her principles, to her way of seeing the world whose imprint was love, only faith, work and education, understanding, respect, patience and above all love for the other would allow to open the space to a different life of free choices to these women who like a little pigeon whose wings had been sewn was prevented from flying in the context of the transformation of the 19th century with regard to women antonia and the congregation contributed to the respect and development of the necessary capacities to break the cages that prevented it both to virtuous uh, women and definitely not to the non-virtuous or unworthy. The former are locked up in a protected but limited and subordinate world. The latter are victims of helplessness, necessity and exploitation. Antonia, based on herself, her her training and her ability to understand others was able to establish a pedago pedagogy of overcoming personal affirmation, acceptance and strength that would contribute and continues to contribute to the liberation of imposed chains. The influence of Antonia and her work goes beyond her girls to touch their heart and contribute to the change of those who following her example formed and form part of the congregation. Even those who know in their work learn to change their perception of the misfortunes of others and the vulnerability of women in an unequal society that is unjust and deeply patriarchal. Antonia was brave among the many contributions she made, not to some women, but to the woman from my standpoint, I highlight to the one to transmit 
that deep ability to take up our, our own life, uh, the right to being human, uh, the choice that starts from security and personal valuation. Women deserve to exercise their rights fully and must develop the capacity, cap capacities to do so. Sister Antonia Maria of Mercy died calm and smiling on February 28, 18, 98. She was 75 years old. As a final point of a life given to others, I'm left with this phrase from Antonia herself. I can take it anymore. To my sisters and girls, my heart. To my father, my soul, so that he may take it to God. As, as a final word, I'd like to say that Antonia lives. She lives in every one of the women who devote their life to work in favor of equality, justice, liberation, life. She lives in every girl who's touched in her depth by the desire to rebuild herself and who with dignity can break the chains that tie her and prevent her from flying. She lives in every person that uh, knowing the work approach it to, to contribute to a development and become more understanding and solid and uh, and beings in solidarity she inhabits in every one of the houses that welcome these girls in the 15 countries where the congregation is present and thank you so much for inviting me to this presentation thank you so much and a very, very strong applause. Thank you so much. So now, before we close this day, we're going to once again show the movie teaser by request of some people who are participating so we get ready for that.
after having uh, shared this space during uh, this time that was uh, certainly not enough the organizing commission thanks you all for your participation special a special thanks to Lourdes once more, but also to the translators who helped us, uh, who helped uh, facilitate this communication. This day was also a great source of joy to meet in a space of reflection in this and the framework of this day entitled strength and charism of a woman and the woman is antonia maria of mercy may her strength and her charism as a woman who made the difference at her time still accompany us broadening our view opening new horizons for other women and for all the people who are in solidarity and identify with this charism and mission. And we remind you that tomorrow at the same time at the 3 p.m. Madrid time, we will have our second uh, session. We uh, look forward to seeing you. And I also wanted to tell you that before leaving the room, please wait one minute to close together with this video song called Antonia's Yes. So we bring our session to a close and we're very glad for to have participated in this moment of reflection. We can now turn on our videos to take some uh, group pictures.
Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here with you. It was a wonderful experience and Antonia lives because she still touches the people and that's what matters most. See you tomorrow.